Thank you for allowing me to present bladder augmentation and catheterizable channels, tips, and tricks. Here are my disclosures. This is going to be a very high-level discussion, plus some of my personal uh, lessons I've learned over the years. We're going to skip over the basics so that we have time during these 10 minutes to focus on more advanced things like algorithms of care. I'm going to focus most of my discussion on adults. So the Mitrofenoff or appendico vesicostomy is great if you can use it. The reason it's great is first, it's the perfect diameter. It's about 12 to 14 French once you dilate it up. Second is that it has an axial blood supply as demonstrated here. So the blood supply, the appendiceal artery, runs parallel to the length of the appendix. This means that when you tunnel it into the detrusor muscle, the blood supply doesn't get in the way, nor does it get in the way when you mature it up through the umbilicus. The mesentery is also very mobile. You can move it down to the bladder and all the way up to the umbilicus. Some of the bad things, at least in adults, is that the appendix is often already used uh, or it's been removed, and it's only about seven to nine centimeters on average. Uh, you really need something quite a bit longer uh, to work, especially in overweight patients, as I'll show. To that point, in children with spina bifida or adults with spinal cord injury who tend to be thin, an appendicovesicostomy is usually possible. That's because the appendix is available, the distance between the bladder and umbilicus is short, the bladder is healthy, it's thin-walled and it's not chronically inflamed, and the abdomen is virgin. So here, on the left side, if we have a child or a thin spinal cord injured patient with a long appendix, you can get a good detrusor tunnel and still reach the umbilicus. And then you can add an augment. Or in a ch child uh, or thin SCI patient with a short appendix, because they're thin, you can oftentimes just mature the appendix to somewhere lower on the abdominal wall. You don't have to reach the umbilicus and you can still get a good detrusor tunnel. Or alternatively, you can mobilize that relatively healthy bladder pecks it up to the anterior abdominal wall and shorten your distance between the bladder and the umbilicus, still get a good detrusor tunnel and mature it to the umbilicus with a short appendix. The situation is quite a bit different in adults with spina bifida who tend to be overweight and who uh, tend to have a thicker abdominal wall and they've had multiple previous abdominal operations. Because of this, the APV is rarely an option. So the distance between the bladder and the umbilicus is long, the bladder is smaller and thicker from chronic urinary tract infections or chronic neurogenic detrusor overactivity, and then the appendix is missing or not long enough. So as pictured here, you have a small contracted bladder which is very far away from the umbilicus, and even if you have a nice long 10 centimeter appendix, by the time you do a three or four centimeter detrusor tunnel, it just won't reach the umbilicus, nor would it go through the very thick abdominal wall. And that's when a double Monty, a spiral Monty, or as I'll show you in a few slides, a CCIC become other options. So the double and the spiral Monty are a possibility, but I've usually avoided them when I can because they have high failure rates. With the double Monty, you get stenosis and false passage at the central connection point between the two Montes. And with the spiral Monty, you get ischemic stenosis at the ends because they're far away from the blood supply, especially that end that com comes up to the umbilicus. Long-term results show that there's a greater than 25% stenosis rate, but there's not good long-term follow-up in adults. So I've tended to use the cutaneous catheterizable ileocecocystoplasty, originally described by Sorosdi back in 1992. This is a modification of the Indiana pouch, so some people call it an Indiana augment, wherein we take 10 centimeters of the cecum and 10 centimeters of the terminal ileum based off the ileocecal pedicle. The ileocecal valve becomes the continence mechanism. You can reinforce that if you like, you staple taper the terminal ileum and that becomes your catheterizable channel. You bivalve the cecum, you bivalve the bladder, and then you place the cecum onto the bladder. 
The CCIC is nice because it puts the ileocecal valve at the dome of the augment, and then the catheterizable channel comes off the top of that. So there's no need for a tunnel. This allows for a short channel, even a small bladder and an obese patient. So as you see here in the left panel, we've got that small contracted bladder where before we didn't have a good, uh, uh, we, we had a long distance between the bladder and the umbilicus. But now with the CCIC, the cath channel comes off the dome of the augment and we have a shorter distance. Also, the terminal ileum that you harvest is about 10 centimeters, so you can usually mature more than enough of it through the umbilicus, and oftentimes I even have to shorten it. One key is that you need to mobilize the right colon all the way through the hepatic flexure as a partial coker maneuver, divide that hepatocolic ligament, and even some of the greater omental attachments to the stomach. When you're done with the mobilization, you should easily see the second stage of the duodenum, the stomach, and perhaps even the inferior vena cava. If you don't see these structures, you have not mobilized enough. So to summarize the advantages of the CCIC, it's templatable, you do it the same way every time. There's no guessing about whether it's gonna be a Mitrofenoff or a Monty. You can always accomplish a CCIC. It creates a well-vascularized channel with an axial blood supply running parallel to the ileum, just like the appendiceal artery runs parallel to the appendix. The cecal mesentery is very mobile. Uh, there's no refashioning of the detubularized cecum. You just split it anti-mesenterically and put it on the bladder. There's no tunneling into a devastated bladder of the channel. The channel can usually be shortened to just six to eight centimeters, which means fewer catheterization problems. There's so much extra channel when you harvest 10 centimeters and only need six to eight that you can rosebud the stoma or brook it, which I think helps reduce the stenosis problems. And then there's fewer hernias. And what do I mean by that? Well, when we do a classic uh, augment and cath channel, we're oftentimes doing that through a midline laparotomy. And indeed, the first several times I did a CCIC, we did that through a midline laparotomy so we could mobilize that hepatic flexure. But nowadays, I do it through a fan and seal incision with a hand-assisted laparoscopic technique. So we put a hand-assist port through the fan and seal incision, a camera through the umbilicus, an assistant port up here, sub -xiphoid. We start the surgery by mobilizing the right colon, and then once the colon is mobilized, we do the rest of the surgery in an open fashion through this fan and steel. And thus, you have no incision going anywhere near the umbilicus, and you reduce your peristomal hernias. As far as augments go, I like to avoid the sigmoid. I prefer the ileum or if we're gonna do a CCIC, we'll use the cecum, obviously. I avoid the sigmoid because there's, it's a higher risk anastomosis. It's a less familial, familiar bowel harvest to us urologists. We're not as uh, familiar with the blood supply or how to do the anastomosis. There also tends to be more mucus, UTIs, and stones in my anecdotal experience compared to the ileum. And the sigmoid can uh, contract, meaning there's more incontinence. The ileum is also nice uh, because if you're harvesting a monte, you can harvest that ileum just adjacent to the monte. So to summarize this presentation, here's an algorithm that I use. We have a patient with neurogenic detrusor overactivity, and they need to be on CIC. So is urethral CIC feasible? Because if it is, that's what we should do. And then we just do anticholinergics plus urethral CIC. If they have persistent neurogenic detrusor overactivity with anticholinergics, then we can add bladder bot botulinum neurotoxin plus urethral CIC. And if they have persistent NDO after that, then ileal augmentation plus urethral CIC. Now let's say the urethral CIC is not feasible. And let's say there's no indication for an augment, so we're just gonna do a cath channel and we're gonna do that cath channel perhaps with anticholinergics or botulinum neurotoxin. So how do we decide which cath channel to use? Well, if there's an adequate appendix, then we'll use the appendicovesicostomy. But if there's not an adequate appendix and a single monte will reach, then we'll use the single monte. And finally, if a single monte won't reach, then I would use either a spiral monte or even a CCIC, even though they don't need an augment just because I like that cath channel so much better than a spiral monte. Going back up to the top here, 
let's say we have uh, an indication for a cath channel and an augment, if the appendix is adequate, I still like to use that, and we'll do an ileal augment plus appendicovesicostomy. But if the appendix is not adequate and a single monte reaches, then we'll do a single monte plus an ileal augment. And then finally, especially in those obese patients or adult spina bifida patients where the single monte usually doesn't reach, we'll do a CCIC. So I hope that explains my thinking, my tips and tricks for uh, operative management of catheterizable channels and augmentation cystoplasty. Thank you.